Good morning and welcome to another Weekly Words from the Wes or WWW. Yes, here we are again. Well, it seems like almost a year ago when I did the introduction for the very first one that, uh, that we did. And we didn't know exactly how we were going to do it or anything then. But uh, we've done quite a few since then. There's so much has happened in, in those months. And uh, we went into a second lockdown in the autumn and I did the first introduction to those too. So here we are, we're, uh, we're going into a third lockdown and um, it's me again to do another introduction because we can't meet in the church anymore for the, for the uh, near future anyway. So we're doing some more online services like this and uh, I thought, well, what can I do to make it slightly different from the previous ones? Well, got a few flowers in and tried to make the place look a bit different as um, you know as we're doing these on hang on oh nice pajamas yeah anyway um oh yeah i see you've got a bacon roll yeah and a cup of coffee so yeah there are advantages to it for us doing these online services aren't there yeah there are some good points anyway as i say i tried to spruce the place up tried to make it look a bit different and uh, it's better but there still seems to be something missing. I don't know. Uh, maybe I need somebody to help me out, but I just don't know who really. Me! Oh. <laughs> wow. I could maybe help you by doing reading the Bible you, reading. Well, that would be great, yeah. That would save me doing it. Yeah, I'm quite happy for you to do that. I just happen to know what the Bible reading is today, which is okay. really good, isn't it? It's taken from Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 1 to 15. Here begins the wonderful story of Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. In the book written by the prophet Isaiah, God announced that he would send his son to earth and that a special messenger would arrive first to prepare the world for his coming. This messenger will live in the barren wilderness, Isaiah said and will proclaim that everyone must straighten out his life to be ready for the Lord's arrival. This messenger was John the Baptist. He lived in the wilderness and taught that all should be baptised as a public announcement of their decision to turn their backs on sin, so that God could forgive them. People from Jerusalem and from all over Judea travelled out into the Judean wastelands to see and hear John, and when they confessed their sins, he baptised them in the River Jordan. His clothes were woven from camel's hair and he wore a leather belt. Locusts and wild honey were his food. Here is a sample of his preaching. Someone is coming soon who is far greater than I am, so much greater than I am, not even worthy to be his slave. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with God's Holy Spirit. Then one day Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptised by John in the River Jordan. The moment Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove descending on him. And a voice from heaven said, You are my beloved son, you are my delight. Immediately the Holy Spirit urged Jesus into the desert. There for 40 days alone except for desert animals, he was subjected to Satan's temptations to sin. And the angels came and cared for him. Later on, after John was arrested by King Herod, Jesus went to Galilee to preach God's good news. At last the time has come, he announced. God's kingdom is near. Turn from your sins and act on this glorious news. May God bless this reading to us this morning. Right, thank you for that, Jeanette. And now, for the uh, rest of the service, we'll hand over to the Reverend Phil. Good morning. Good morning everyone. Very pleased to be able to welcome you to our home again and although I'll be speaking from our lounge I'm really pleased that we can still share together, we can pray, we can have worship songs and you can sing at home and we can look at the word together. Big thank you to Colin for introducing our time together in that way. Oh, no, what we're going to do now we're going to move to a time when I'm going to pray and during this time 
I, I'm going to remember something in particular. Today is, is a day which has been set aside by the Wesleyan Reform Union as a day of prayer and repentance. And I'm going to briefly uh, pray along the lines that we've been asked to do. You should have done, if you've had our weekly uh, email, had details about this, a copy of the letter. I would urge you, if you're able to, to spend some time today in prayer and repentance. Use that letter, just bring those things to God. So please join me now as we pray. Loving Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come back again to meeting in our homes, not being able to be together in the hall. Lord, I realise that some people have been doing this all the way through. And today is not much different. For others, Lord, they've been uh, used to going together uh, to the hall and meeting together. But Father God, I pray that this will, because we've had to change our plans again, Lord, that that won't in any way spoil our worship. We bring to you, Lord, our nation as we come in this time of real difficulty. Lord, we've been put into what's been called a national lockdown when our freedom has been uh, reduced, when there are restrictions upon us. But we thank you, Father, that your word can never be restricted. Your word can never uh, be removed. Lord, your word will last forever. And thank you that we can share in that today. We do pray, Lord, today, especially for those who are finding these days really difficult. We think about those, Lord, who are in hospital and we see the number of cases of people being in hospital rising alarmingly. Lord, we pray for those that are, are struggling with life. We remember parents who are struggling with teaching their children at home and maybe having to try and juggle that with working at home too. We pray for them. We remember, Lord, those who are suffering from illnesses which are not COVID. And Lord, it's very easy uh, to almost put that to one side. But Lord, people are still suffering from other things. And so we do bring them before you this morning, Lord. We pray that you will give them your touch of healing. But today, Lord, our time has been... Um, shaped by what we've been asked to do by the Wesleyan Reform Union and uh, we come before you this morning in repentance. We call out on behalf of our nation and our communities for the times when we failed you, for when we have walking away from you, when your word is given no place. For our churches, Lord, we pray that you will renew and refresh our churches by your Holy Spirit. We pray that you will forgive us for when we have failed you. We pray that you will bring healing, especially if there are situations where there is hurt and heartache. For the times, perhaps, Lord, when we have gone away from your way. Lord, forgive us if we've ever not preached the full gospel. We do pray for the spiritual direction of our union of churches. We pray that you will bless those who have authority. We pray, Lord, <clears throat> that you will bring a, a clarity of what you want us to do as individual churches and as a group of churches. Lord, we want to spur one another on. We want to Lord, find your way forward for us. And we pray that on this day, which is set aside, as people all over our nation pray and bring repentance to you, Lord, that you will hear our prayer, that you will bring healing where healing is needed. And Father, that you will give us vision, a clarity of vision for the future. Lord, we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you like to join with me as we share in the words of the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Let me just remind you, I would just urge you, if you're able to spend some time together uh, today uh, and bring those prayers for our union of churches and for our church too. We're going to have a worship song before we look at the word today, so it's over to our group. One of my Christmas presents this year was an autobiography by a footballer called Don Masson. Now you might not have heard of him, um, he played for Scotland, he played for Queen's Park Rangers and he also played for my uh, the team that I follow, Notts County. And so this has just come out and um, it's got best wishes from Don Masson in it and also in the back it's got a list of those who pre-ordered it, called it the Don Masson Fan Club, and there my name can be found in that. But it's quite an interesting title to it, 
because it's called Still Saying Sorry. And it follows his upbringing and his football career and it follows um, what he's now doing. But he's in his middle 70s now and as I said it's called Still Saying Sorry. And he starts the book by admitting that when he was a footballer he was very self-centred and he was arrogant and he really wasn't the nicest person, maybe. In the 1980s, his mother died and he came into contact with a minister from a United Reformed Church. And to cut the story short, he became a Christian. Now he ends the book, and I've um, jumped to that, I haven't got there yet, uh, by saying that he spent the rest of his life trying to make amends. And that there are many people who tell him is a different person. Well, this morning, we're going to begin a new series of sermons from the Gospel of Mark. And like my book, it's about one person, but one who would never have to say sorry, for he never did anything wrong. He was never self-centred. And the key verse in this is Mark 10 verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, as we work through this gospel, and I'm not sure yet whether we're going to go right through it or just the early chapters, I want to cover quite a lot of it each week. And my aim is to bring to you the overall message of it. It's all about Jesus. Now, I know that you will say, of course it is, because it's the gospel. But I decided this week that it would be a good idea to just read right through the gospel. And as I did that, Jesus just jumped out of the pages again in a new way. And my hope is that he will for us too as we go through this series of sermons. We don't know how long it's going to be while we're still recording it in this way or whether we'll be going back into the hall. But this is a new series. So I would just urge you, look again, or maybe for a new time, for the first time, at the story of Jesus. Well, let's look at a few details uh, before we begin. Who was it written by? Well, it seems that it was written by John Mark. Uh, he was not one of the, uh, of the first 12 disciples, but he did play quite a large part in the book of Acts. In chapter 12 of Acts, we have the remarkable story where Peter escaped from prison and uh, his chains literally fell off. And if you know the story, he went to a house which belonged to a woman called Mary and they wouldn't at first let him in. But Mary was the mother of John Mark. John Mark joined Paul's first missionary journey, but it seems that he blotted his copybook somewhat because he left partway through. And that led to a dispute and a split between Barnabas and Paul. But later he comes into the company of Peter and Peter, in one of his letters, calls him his son. He's not his son, literally, but probably one who came to a knowledge of Jesus under Peter. Mark's gospel has been described as Jesus in action. He is always doing something. And it goes straight in without mentioning anything of his, of his childhood or his upbringing. You won't find anything of the nativity story in Mark. But as we, as I say that, it's always fast moving. As I read through it, I noticed again and again something that I've often said, that Jesus is always in control. Sometimes when it might seem that he isn't, he is. There's no rush about him, but the gospel keeps moving. One of the most used words is, is immediately or at once. 
or if you use the older version of the Bible, straightway. And it's used 41 times. And so that just shows us that it's just a, a continually fast moving story. In Mark's Gospel, there is not so much of the teaching as in the other Gospels. Rather, it's more of his actions and what he did. Finally, before we actually start looking at this, I saw this Gospel described as Jesus for beginners, probably because uh, it's written in quite a straightforward language, maybe because there are more actions and miracles than teaching, so people find that a bit easier to understand. But it certainly would not come into that series of books, Jesus for Dummies. Not at all. This is part of the Word of God. We're going to discover more of Jesus from the first part of Mark's Gospel. Well, the foreword to my book by Don Masson is written by another former footballer called Frank McClintock. And it's entitled, Who is this bloke? Now, the reason is that when Don signed for the club that he played for, he had never heard of him. But I want us from these very early verses in the Gospels to see that we do not ask, who is this? But rather, we've got three very clear testimonies as to who Jesus is. And so, first of all, we have Mark, who wrote the Gospel. Verse 1 says the beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ the Son of God. How we need good news. You know, there is a glint, isn't there, with the, roll, uh, the rollout of the vaccine. But every time I look at the news, it really does seem dismal. The two main stories, as I've been doing these notes, are first of all COVID-19, of course, but also the violent riots in Washington, D.C. And as I read through the gospel and I recommend that you do this as well it was good news followed by good news it starts and it ends with good news and that's what the gospel is it is good news that Jesus has come into the world to save sinners not to serve but to be served and to give his life as a ransom for many well who does Mark testify that he is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And Mark brings it out from the very beginning. My book starts, who is this? Mark says, this is who this is, the Son of God. This is no ordinary man. Almost at the end of the gospel, people are asking Jesus if he is the Son of God. This is right at the end of his life. This is on trial. Verse 61 of chapter 14. Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. This is when he's being questioned. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? But John has answered that question right at the very first verse. Jesus is the Son of God. Secondly, we find John the Baptist. Now, if this is all a book all about Jesus, why does John the Baptist play such a significant part? Well, the answer is that he is the connector between the Old Testament prophecies and the coming of Christ. There is a 400 year kind of silence between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the new. This is what it says, Mark 1, 2 and 3. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, and that's going back some 700 years plus, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. That's verses 2 and 3. Now this is made of two prophecies from Isaiah and Micah. And Mark starts by saying this is the good news about Jesus. But the Old Testament says that before the Christ comes, there will be a messenger preparing the way. And I love the way that 
that uh, Mark puts it in verse 4. And so John came. It's a matter of fact, isn't it? And so John came. He has the characteristics, of course, of the Old Testament prophets. He's out in the desert. He's wearing rough clothes. He's eating a very simple diet. And his message, too, was quite simple in a way. You must repent and turn away from your sins. Simple, but profound and important. But John preached that you must do more than just change your mind. Their repentance had to be done in conduct too. And we're going to look very briefly at repentance a little later on. The crowds were coming to him. And we read that all the Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem. Think how that must have been. I can't imagine that there was much social distancing. But Luke records how John told them that they must produce fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, what they do must prove the change in their lives. John says in his letter, much misunderstood in many ways, your works must prove your faith. Well, what does John testify about him? We read in verses 7 and 8, and this was his message. After me comes, comes the one who is more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. People must have realised that there was something great about John. In fact, Jesus said, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet John says he's not even worthy to tie his sandals. The lowest job. Now, I've noticed and I've said before that I tend to watch, if I can, the updates uh, by the Prime Minister or whoever is with him. And on Friday, uh, Thursday, uh, it was the chief executive, I think he is, of the NHS who was speaking. And as he was speaking, I was really convinced by him. He really took, took my mind. And there was also somebody from the army, brigadier someone. And he was talking about how the army are going to be involved in the rollout of the vaccine. And again, he spoke with authority. And this is what I think John the Baptist did. And that's why people were coming to him. They were coming to him out in the desert. John said that when Jesus comes, he will baptise with the Holy Spirit. Now, John's baptism with water was an outward one, a washing for the cleansing of sins. But Jesus will bring through the Holy Spirit a permanent inward cleansing of the heart and create a whole new spiritual life within. This is who we are meeting when we meet Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. The third witness is God the Father. See, while, while, while John is baptising, there must have been many people coming. I've already told you what it says. And along came Jesus. Now, John, I think, has the right attitude. Matthew records how he had said that when Jesus came to him to be baptised, he said it should be the other way round. You ought to be baptising me. But Jesus needed to be baptised. And we could say, but isn't baptism about sin? Yet Jesus never sinned. That is correct. But he still needed to be baptised. Why? Well, Matthew brings it out in verse uh, 15 of chapter 3. Jesus says, let it be so now. In other words, you baptise me. It is proper for us to do this to fulfil all righteousness. It is in obedience to God. Jesus is identifying himself with the people of God. There's a, um, a, a verse down in Isaiah 53, right back in the Old Testament again. He poured out his life unto death. 
and he was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Means that he identified himself with sinners, with us. And his actual baptism is important. But what is the testimony from God? Just as Jesus was coming out of the water, Mark wrote, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Mark has written that he is the son of God, but he is declared as the son of God here by the father. Not only is he the son, but he is loved by God and he pleases God. These are really important points because if we are going to discover Jesus from this gospel over the coming weeks, we must know who he is. And Mark makes it clear, John the Baptist makes it clear, and God makes it clear. Almost as a passing comment, Mark then speaks of the temptations of Jesus very briefly, and then the imprisonment of John, and we'll show we shall see what happens there later on in this gospel. But then he moves straight into the ministry of Jesus. Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. John said, prepare yourselves. Jesus says, the time is now. The years and years, hundreds of them, of waiting are over. The kingdom of God is near. And we see this in two ways. In one sense, the kingdom of God is here because the kingdom of God comes in the person of Christ. But the kingdom is coming in rules which are surrendered, sorry, in lives which are surrendered to God, where God rules in the heart of his people. But how do you become part of that kingdom? Mark started his gospel by speaking of the good news of Jesus Christ. And only 15 verses in, Jesus himself is also speaking of that good news. And there is a response which must be made. Jesus says, repent and believe the good news. To repent is to turn away from our life of sin. It's not just about being sorry for what we've done. It's about deciding to do something about it and turning to God. That's what repentance is. It's turning away from our old life, turning away from sin and turning to God. But then Jesus says you must believe. You must believe in Jesus as saviour. Believe that his death was in our place. It is to be born again and to become a child of God. And this is all connected with what's gone before. Because Mark testified that he is writing the good news about Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. John testified that Jesus will bring through the Holy Spirit a permanent inward cleansing of the heart. And God testified that he is the son of God who is loved and who pleases him. See, I wanted to bring those three testimonies out to you this morning, because if you take them to heart, there can be no other response than to do as Jesus says, repent and believe this good news. Now, Jesus said it then, and he said it to the people that he met then, but he also says it to us too. Today, he says, repent and believe the good news. Just to, as we come to an end, I want to go back to my book. I stood on the terraces for many years and I watched Don Masson. What a player he was. He could 
just take a football and control it and pass it. He scored lots of lots of goals. He was kind of the one that all the football went through. He was a fantastic player. But I only stood on the sidelines. I could only admire him. It's very doubtful if I'll ever know him. But the Son of God, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Not only can I know him, I can have a, ref a relationship with him. He is my Lord and my Saviour. He said, repent and believe the good news. I did. And because of that, he's now mine. I can have that intimate relationship with him. And so can you. Let's have a time of reflection and prayer. Let's take a few moments just to reflect on those testimonies that we heard from the Gospel of Mark. Mark says that he writes good news about Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. John testifies that Jesus will bring through the Holy Spirit an inward cleansing of the heart. And God testifies that this is his son who is loved and pleases him. Think on our response to this. Jesus said, repent and believe this good news. So if we have already in our lives taken that step, let's thank him for all that he has done. Let's thank him that in all this time of difficulty and hardship, this time of COVID and not good news, that the gospel is good news for all who will believe. But maybe Maybe you've never taken that step of turning to God, turning to Christ, turning away from a life of sin and believing that Jesus died in your place. Then do what Jesus said, repent and believe. Father, we thank you for your word, which is good news. May we live this good news this coming week. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's finish with a worship song.
Thank you for joining us. Hope to see you again next week when we shall be moving on in Mark's Gospel. Until then, stay safe, follow all the advice and may you know the presence of God with you wherever you go. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us both today and forevermore. Amen. Thank you and goodbye.